Hello everyone, uh, welcome to our uh, next session for biochemistry. In the previous class, we had uh, talked about uh, the lipid classification and the fatty acid classification. So today we are continuing from there and uh, today we are going to talk about the oxidation of the fatty acid, the metabolism. We had started the fatty acid metabolism. So first we'll discuss the oxidation and then next class we'll talk about the biosynthesis of the fatty acid. So today we are going to talk about the oxidation of the fatty acid. All right. So let's start with the oxidation of fatty acid. Now, when you talk about oxidation of fatty acid, you have to understand that the various mechanism by which what fatty acid oxidation can occur, the various mechanism by which fatty acid oxidation can occur, these include these include the alpha oxidation. the beta oxidation the beta oxidation and a very minor pathway called the omega oxidation i hope the voice is clear i hope you are able to see the video properly and uh, the screen is also visible to everyone if there is any problem just let us know so that uh, we can make any technical corrections if required so fatty oxidation can be alpha oxidation beta oxidation or the omega oxidation uh, most important of them is obviously the beta oxidation but alpha oxidation omega oxidation can also occur out of this omega oxidation is quite rare it is quite rare another point to keep in mind is each of these oxidation occur in different compartment for example alpha oxidation occurs in the peroxisomes it occurs in the peroxisomes the beta oxidation occurs in the mitochondria and the omega oxidation occurs in the endoplasmic reticulum it occurs in endoplasmic reticulum all right so different compartments for the different oxidation in addition, the alpha oxidation is specific for branched fatty acids. It is specific for branched fatty acids. Beta oxidation can be used for small chain fatty acid, medium chain fatty acid and long chain fatty acid. Whereas omega oxidation I have already told you, it is rare it can be used again for small chain medium chain or the long chain fatty acids here one extra point i would like to tell you that the very long chain fatty acid also get metabolized in peroxisome by beta oxidation like reaction it is not exactly beta oxidation but it is beta oxidation like reactions we don't call it beta oxidation but similar reaction are used to break down the very long chain fatty acid however the compartment used for that is the peroxisomes so this is the uh, compartments and the types of fatty acid and where they are metabolized what are the different pathways but a very important point to remember is before the fatty acid can metabol can be metabolized it needs to get activated before uh, it uh, gets activated it cannot get metabolized the activation the activation of the fatty acids is done by the enzyme acyl coenzyme A synthetase now as you can see the different compartments are there in which the oxidation of fatty acids occur so it follows that acyl coenzyme A synthetase is attached to each of the three compartments it is attached to the mitochondria it is attached to the peroxisomes it is attached to the endoplasmic reticulum all right so what we'll do i uh, will first uh, see how the fatty acids are activated and in case of mitochondria how they are transported inside the mitochondria and then we'll quickly take a look at the reactions uh, that are occurring 
all right so let us first take a look at the activation and the transport we'll use the example of long chain fatty acid and how they are transported inside the mitochondria as you know the mitochondria will have uh, two uh, membranes one is in the outer mitochondrial membrane the outer mitochondrial membrane all right and then this is the outer mitochondrial membrane and then we have the inner mitochondrial membrane then we have the inner mitochondrial membrane right in between the two we have the intermembranous space here we have the matrix and here we have the cytoplasm right so this is the uh, composition of the different layers in terms of cytoplasm and the mitochondria now in the outer layer we have this enzyme that we're talking about the acyl coenzyme a synthetase the acyl coenzyme synthetase present on the outer membrane what it will do the fatty acid coenzyme a they are joined together to form the acyl coenzyme a obviously atp is used up and it is converted into amp when i say amp remember this means two atp have been used up two atp have been used up so fatty acid uh, it gets attached to the coenzyme a and gets converted into the acyl coenzyme a so first activation done by the acyl coenzyme a synthetase which is present in the uh, outer membrane this acyl coenzyme a because the outer mitochondrial membrane is uh, quite permeable and this uh, it reaches the intermembranous space where the acyl coenzyme a combines with carnitine it combines with carnitine the coenzyme a is removed and what we get is the acyl carnitine this particular reaction is catalyzed by yet another enzyme this is commonly known as carnitine palmitoyl transferase type 1 cpt type 1 this is the carnitine palmitoyl transferase type 1 which converts the acyl coenzyme a and carnitine into the acyl carnitine in the intermembranous space in the intermembranous space this conversion has been completed also known as the carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1 cpt1 this is the cpt1 now this acyl carnitine is brought into the matrix it is brought into the matrix by a transporter known as carnitine acyl carnitine translocase 
carnitine acyl carnitine translocase what it does it will bring the acyl carnitine inside in exchange for a carnitine molecule so carnitine goes out and the acyl carnitine comes in carnitine goes out and the acyl carnitine comes in and lastly with the help of the carnitine palmitoyl transferase 2 this acyl carnitine this acyl carnitine will join with a coenzyme A and regenerate the acyl coenzyme A. This acyl coenzyme A can now go for beta oxidation and the carnitine which has been released is used to bring in another molecule of the acyl carnitine is used to bring in another molecule of the acyl carnitine so this is how the whole activation and transport of the fatty acid occurs into the matrix remember the inner vertical membrane is not uh, readily permeable so we need a specific transport mechanism for the fatty acid particularly for the long chain fatty acid the small chain <coughs> and the medium chain fatty acid they can enter they can enter without carnitine also they can enter without carnitine also but uh, the carnitine is critical for the long chain fatty acid without long chain fatty acid uh, without carnitine the long chain fatty acid cannot enter inside the matrix so now the acyl coenzyme is present inside the matrix and where it will undergo the beta oxidation all right so let's take a look at the beta oxidation how the beta oxidation is occurring inside the mm, mitochondrial matrix for this purpose uh, let's uh, start our story with a saturated fatty acid having 16 carbon we are starting our story with a carbon 16 mm -hmm. yes yes so we have the carbon 16 saturated fatty acid now the we want to Sorry for the interruption. Okay, so let's start our story with the carbon 16 saturated fatty acid, and we are trying to take a look at the beta oxidation, right? Now, beta oxidation is a cyclical process. It is a cyclical process. So uh, it goes in multiple cycle, and every time we run a cycle of beta oxidation, our saturated fatty acid is decreased by two carbon. So carbon 16 becomes the carbon 14 when you run one round of beta oxidation the carbon 16 becomes the carbon 14 and in this process and in this process what is generated take a look one nadh one fadh2 and one acetyl coenzyme A. The two carbon which are removed are released as acetyl coenzyme A. So with every round of beta oxidation, the same three products will be generated repeated. The same three products will be generated repeatedly. One NADH, one FADH2, one acetyl coenzyme. I'll tell you the reactions. Don't worry. We'll come to the reactions. 
and at the same time the size of the carbon chain will decrease by 2 because the two carbon have been taken out so carbon 14 becomes carbon 12 carbon 12 becomes carbon 10 carbon 10 becomes carbon 8 which becomes carbon 6 which becomes carbon 4 which finally becomes carbon 2 which finally becomes carbon 2 now please note this carbon 2 which has been formed at the end itself is acetyl coenzyme so what is happening every time we run one cycle of beta oxidation the size of carbon chain is decreasing by two carbon the size of carbon chain is decreasing by two carbons and every time they will generate the same products every time they will generate the same products right so two questions how many rounds of beta oxidation are required to complete the breakdown of a saturated fatty acid first question how many rounds of beta oxidation required to complete the breakdown of the saturated fatty acid so the answer is number of beta oxidation required is n by 2 minus 1 see when you reach the carbon 2 level when you reach the carbon 2 level further breakdown is not required because it itself is a style coenzyme all right so the number of beta oxidation cycles required to break down the saturated fatty acid is n by 2 minus 1 so all of this will also be produced n by 2 minus 1 times all right it will also be produced n by 2 minus 1 times what this means is the amount of nadh will be n by 2 minus 1 the amount of fadh2 will also be n by 2 minus 1 but the amount of acetyl coenzyme a will be n by 2 minus 1 plus 1 acetyl coenzyme a from here so effectively the number of acetyl coenzyme a, only only the acetyl coenzyme a, is actually n by 2 for other substances it is n by 2 minus 1 for other substances it is n by 2 minus 1 and it can help us to calculate the energetics all right it will help us to calculate the energetics how we remember from 1 nadh we are going to get 2.5 atp from 1 fadh2 we are going to get 1.5 atp from 1 acetyl coenzyme we are going to get 10 atp all this we have done previously in the carbonate metabolism so we replace the value of n with 16 we started with the carbon 16 so what happens here you get the value here you get the value 7 here also you get the value 7 and here you get the value 8 for NADH we said 2.5 ATP for FADH we said 1.5 ATP and for acetyl coenzyme we know that we are going to get the 10 ATP result Seventeen point five ATP, ten point five ATP, and here you get eighty ATP. The total of which comes out to one zero eight ATP. So, total ATP produced on complete oxidation of carbon 16 saturated acid is 108 ATP but what is the net gain don't forget that 2 ATP were used up in the beginning for activation all right if you don't return the loan that you've taken then you will become the Vijay Malia so whatever loan has been borrowed must be returned before you calculate the profit net gain is the profit so the profit or the net production of ATP is 106 ATP for a saturated fatty acid 
containing 16 carbon 16 carbon such as fatty acid is going to generate 106 ATP on complete oxidation please note the term complete oxidation is able to give us the 106 ATP now what you will do you will repeat the calculations quickly when we have the carbon 18 saturated fatty acid how many ATP is the net gain you have 30 seconds very quickly calculate and give me the answer very quickly calculate and give me the answer <coughs> how many ATP will be produced so in this case what will happen when the value of N when the value of N is 18 N by 2 minus 1 is 8 N by 2 is equal to 9 this means NADH will be 8 FADH2 will be 8 and acetyl coenzyme A will be 9 right so NADH will give us 2.5 FADH2 will give us 1.5 acetyl coenzyme A will give us 10 20 12 and 90 giving us the sum total of 120 but again don't forget sorry this is 122 don't forget to remove the ATP required for activation so that the final result is 120 ATP so the correct answer is 120 ATP the correct answer is 120 ATP net gain for carbon 18 such as fatty acid on complete oxidation will get the 120 ATP remember the carbon 18 such as fatty acid is the stearic acid it is a stearic acid and the carbon 16 saturated fatty acid is the palmitic acid so sometimes the question can be there calculate the uh, net production of ATP on complete metabolism of palmitic acid so you should know when I say palmitic acid it means I am talking about the carbon 16 saturated fatty acid and when I am talking about the stearic acid it means the carbon 18 uh, saturated uh, fatty acid all right so i'm so happy to see that most of you are able to get how we are going to uh, complete out the calculations now at this point i'll quickly tell you the reactions which are occurring in every round what is happening in every round of beta oxidation what are the reactions which are occurring in one round of beta oxidation all right let's see so what happens mm, let's start with acyl coenzyme A let's say the number of carbon atom is N acyl coenzyme A so initially the acyl coenzyme A is acted upon by the enzyme acyl coenzyme A dehydrogenase the acyl coenzyme A dehydrogenase and the acyl coenzyme A dehydrogenase will convert FAD into FADH2 it will convert FAD into FADH2 so at this point what we get is uh, the one unsaturated bond is generated one unsaturated bond is generated 
at uh, position 2 if you don't write this position then also it is okay even you don't need to know the reactions also if you know the enzymes that is more than enough so what we get is a trans enoyl coenzyme A still the number of carbon at this point is still n all right so we get the delta 2 trans enoyl coenzyme A this delta trans enoyl coenzyme A is acted upon by the hydrates. The full name will be delta 2 trans enoyl hydrates. The full name will be delta 2 trans enoyl hydrates. You can just write the hydrates. So, what happens at this time? The double bond is opened up and we get the hydroxyacyl coenzyme A. We get the hydroxyacyl coenzyme A. At this point, we have another dehydrogenase, the hydroxyacyl coenzyme A dehydrogenase. The another dehydrogenase will come in. The hydroxyacyl coenzyme A dehydrogenase will come in. And this time, the reducing equivalent is transferred to NAD. it is transferred to NAD all right resulting in formation of in the keto acyl coenzyme A. so what we get here is the keto acyl coenzyme A the last enzyme which is acting here is the very important thiolase Right, thiolase will form the acyl coenzyme A, but this acyl coenzyme A will have two carbon cleaved from it. See, this one is having n number of carbon, this one is having n number of carbon. So, this has got the two carbon cleaved from it in the form of the acetyl coenzyme A. All right. So, what is happening? First, a dehydrogenase which forms the FADH2, then the hydratase, then again dehydrogenase which forms the NADH, and lastly, thiolase which will generate the acetyl coenzyme A. Alright, and then what will happen? The acyl coenzyme A will again undergo the same set of reactions but this time the number of carbon is decreased by 2 next time the number of carbon will further be decreased by 2 and in this way the cycle continues like we had seen previously see every time we run the beta oxidation the number of carbon will keep decreasing by 2 which is released as the acetyl coenzyme A when we are left with the 2 carbon residue the 2 carbon residue is also the acetyl coenzyme A it doesn't need to be broken down further so this is the set of reactions which are carried out in the beta oxidation the set of reactions which are carried out in the beta oxidation all right so as you can see large amount of uh, ATP will be generated now here two things are there the unsaturated fatty acid similar path will be there first the unsaturated fatty acid is converted into the saturated fatty acid first it is converted into the saturated fatty acid and then further metabolism will occur by beta oxidation details not required and then further metabolism will occur by the beta oxidation but what is more important is sometimes instead of the even chain fatty acid we can have the odd chain fatty acid for example instead of carbon 16 we have the carbon 17 saturated fatty acid so when you go to the last step we don't get the carbon 2 we get the carbon 3 saturated fatty acid this carbon 3 saturated fatty acid is the propionyl coenzyme A. 
that is the propionyl coenzyme so this propionyl coenzyme has to be metabolized there is a set of reactions by which the propionyl coenzyme a is converted into succinyl coenzyme a and at this point this succinyl coenzyme a will enter the tca cycle i'll show you the reactions by which the propionyl coenzyme a is converted to succinyl coenzyme a don't worry we'll quickly take a look at the reactions by which the propionyl coenzyme a is getting converted into the succinyl coenzyme a let's see Mm, where we okay here we go yeah let's take a look at the reactions okay let's see yeah this is better this is better so that you can see it uh, clearly so what is happening here see the propanol coenzyme a, the propanol coenzyme a, it is here uh, sometimes the propionate is there which can also be converted into the propanol coenzyme a by the acyl coenzyme a synthesis just like for any fatty acid so we have the propanol coenzyme a at the end of the um, breakdown this propanol coenzyme a is acted upon by the propanol coenzyme a carboxylase when you are using the carboxylase the vitamin required is biotin biotin is vitamin b7 b7 is required for carboxylation atp is also required to provide the energy and the propanol coenzyme a is converted as you can see into the methyl malonyl coenzyme a the d form methyl malonyl coenzyme a and quickly it is converted to the l form of the methyl malonyl coenzyme a. so the propanol coenzyme a first converted to methyl malonyl coenzyme a and then under the influence of methyl malonyl coenzyme a mutase it is converted into the succinyl coenzyme a here you can see the vitamin b12 is required okay and then the succinyl coenzyme a will go to the tca cycle it will go on to participate in the tca cycle one important point to note here sometimes the b12 enzyme may be absent and this reaction will get blocked all right so when b12 deficiency is there what we see is methyl malonic aciduria methyl malonic aciduria is a characteristic feature in b12 deficiency when there is b12 deficiency orange and fatty acid cannot get metabolized properly and the methyl malonic acid will accumulate resulting in what is known as the methyl malonic aciduria measurement of methyl malonyl in the urine gives us an indication of the b12 status of the individual so this is how the propanol coenzyme a is quickly converted into the succinyl coenzyme a two very important uh, uh, vitamins which are required here are the b7 and the b12 b7 and b12 are required for complete oxidation of the orchin fatty acid whereby propanol coenzyme is converted to succinyl coenzyme via the tca cycle it can also go for gluconeogenesis so if you recall we had said in the uh, fatty acid only the last three carbon of the odd chain fatty acid which will make the propanol coenzyme can participate in gluconeogenesis this is what we had highlighted previously so remember the last three carbon of odd chain fatty acid can also participate in gluconeogenesis by forming the intermediate of the tca cycle so this is about the beta oxidation this is about the beta oxidation let's take a look at the alpha oxidation alpha oxidation i already told you 
alpha oxidation okay okay about alpha oxidation i already told you that this occurs in the peroxisome we have discussed occurs in the peroxisome and it is used to uh, break down fatty acids which have branching which have branching so it is used to break down the branched fatty acid it is used to break down the branched fatty acid sometimes there can be defect in this breakdown there can be defect in the breakdown which will result in the refsum disease so i'll repeat alpha see in beta what was happening two carbon removed at one time we got the acetyl coenzyme alpha oxidation the name alpha is there because we are removing only one carbon we are breaking the alpha bond when you break the alpha bond you will get one carbon so it is called the alpha oxidation in beta oxidation we are removing two carbon we are breaking the beta bond so this alpha oxidation removes one carbon at a time and it occurs within the peroxisome all right the only significant branch fatty acid in our diet is the phytanic acid coming from plants the phytanic acid which is broken down by the alpha oxidation rarely in individuals one of the enzyme required for this breakdown the phytanoyl coenzyme a dioxygenase also known as phytanoyl coenzyme a oxidase may be missing so what will happen the branch fatty acid cannot get metabolized it will start accumulating and it will give rise to what is known as the refsum's disease here i'd like to point out sometimes the peroxisome itself may be absent or it may be empty means the structure is there but the enzymes are not there in this case besides the metabolism of the branched fatty acid another metabolism which gets affected is for the very long chain fatty acid remember i told you the very long chain fatty acid gets metabolized in the peroxisome also so both of them will be affected but the main problem is in the metabolism of the very long chain fatty acid recall we had said inside the cns there is a very large amount of very long chain fatty acid which are continuously recycled so the very long chain fatty acid which are synthesized in the cns will not be broken down resulting condition resulting condition is known as zellweger syndrome resulting condition is known as the zellweger syndrome the other name for zellweger syndrome is the cerebro hepato renal syndrome these are the places where the very long chain fatty acid will start accumulating the cerebro hepato renal syndrome remember what is getting accumulated primarily it will be the very long chain fatty acid with some amount of branched fatty acid which is coming from the diet in the cns only the vlcf will accumulate because the branched fatty acid in the uh, uh, cns will not be there dietary fatty acid cannot cross the blood brain barrier so the dietary phytanic acid will not enter the brain so in the brain accumulation will be only for vlcf in the rest of the body there will be accumulation of large amount of vlcf and small amount of the branched fatty acid which is coming from the diet this is known as the zellweger syndrome so zellweger syndrome will occur when the whole of the peroxisome is not working whole of the peroxisome is not working either it is absent or it is empty if only one enzyme the phytanoyl coenzyme a oxidase or the dioxygenase is absent in that case we get the milder version which is the refsum's disease we get the milder version which is the refsum's disease okay so this is about the alpha oxidation this is the alpha oxidation of uh, fatty acids and the last one in the series was the omega oxidation last one is omega oxidation omega oxidation is the oxidation of the most distant carbon the carbon most distant from the carboxyl group it is removed one by one so the oxidation of omega carbon occurs so it is called omega oxidation i already told you it occurs in the endoplasmic reticulum 
in only two places in the liver and in the kidney in liver and in the kidney the pathway per se is not important what is important is the enzymes which are involved in this metabolism they are also used for alcohol metabolism all right this means primarily alcohol metabolism will occur in the liver and the kidney cells primary site for alcohol metabolism is liver and the kidney cells another important point to remember is these enzymes are inducible inducible means the concentration or the amount of enzyme will increased when continuously you provide large amount of the substrate means if large amount of alcohol is present these enzymes will be upregulated so that the ability of the body to metabolize the substrate will be increased all right so these enzymes can be inducible when a regular amount of alcohol is consumed the production of the enzyme will increase and more and more of alcohol can get metabolized this is called a tolerance those who consume uh, alcohol on regular basis they are able to tolerate the larger amount of alcohol because before they become disoriented all right so this is a very important uh, aspect of alcohol consumption which is uh, uh, correlated with the oxidation of the fatty acids okay so this is about uh, the different types of oxidation that you should uh, know let's go back and quickly do the recap of uh, what we have discussed till now let's quickly do the recap in the next session we'll talk about the various synthetic pathways okay so we talk about the fatty oxidation and i told you there are three mechanisms of the fatty acid oxidation starting with starting with the alpha oxidation starting with the alpha oxidation we told you for the branched fatty acid for the branched fatty acids most common is the beta oxidation which is occurring in the mitochondria for the small chain medium chain and the long chain fatty acid rarely we see the omega oxidation which occurs in the endoplasmic reticulum i also mentioned at this point that the metabolism of the very long chain fatty acid occurs in the peroxisome by a beta oxidation like reaction by a beta oxidation like reaction okay so this this is the summary of the oxidation of fatty acid beta oxidation and alpha oxidation and some metabolism in the peroxisome for the very long chain fatty acid omega oxidation only need to know because uh, the enzymes will be used also for the alcohol metabolism only in the liver and in the kidney before the fatty acid can be metabolized they need to be activated the activation is done by the enzyme acyl coenzyme a synthetase and therefore it must be attached to each of the three compartments where the fatty acid is getting metabolized they are the mitochondria the peroxisome and the endoplasmic reticulum so the acyl coenzyme a synthetase is attached to each of the three compartments the mitochondria the peroxisome and the endoplasmic reticulum then we said that the long chain fatty acid need to be transported inside the mitochondria the small chain fatty acid the medium chain fatty acid can enter even without carnitine they can use the pathway that we discussed but they can enter even without that pathway so first we saw the activation of fatty acid the fatty acid is converted to acyl coenzyme a by the enzyme acyl coenzyme a synthetase in which atp is converted into amp the atp is converted into amp right so uh, two atp equivalent have been used up this acyl coenzyme a combines with carnitine to form the acyl carnitine by the enzyme cpt1 the acyl carnitine is transported inside in exchange for a molecule of carnitine by the carnitine acyl carnitine translocase and now this acyl carnitine 
is finally converted back to acyl coenzyme A and then it can go for beta oxidation. This uh, conversion is done by the carnitine pyrimidyl transferase 2. The carnitine which is released is exchanged for another acyl carnitine. This is how the acyl coenzyme will reach inside, particularly the long chain fatty acid. The small and medium chain fatty acid can travel on their own because of their nature. They are able to traverse the membrane. The long chain fatty acid is not able to traverse the membrane. Once the acyl coenzyme is inside, it will participate in the beta oxidation. One extra point I want to tell you here. The better name for carnitine palmitoyl transferase would be carnitine acyl transferase because it doesn't act only on the palmitic acid it will act on all the fatty acid whether it is small chain medium chain long chain fatty acid it acts on all of them however the most common is the palmitic acid so we use the term carnitine palmitoyl transferase another reason we use the term cpt is if we use the term carnitine acyl transferase this will also become cat and this is also cat so there can be a lot of confusion that's why although the more correct name is carnitine acyl transferase to avoid confusion we don't generally use that term we can use that term but it is avoided to uh, minimize the confusion so in some books if you find carnitine acyl transferase please don't get confused that is also correct the carnitine acyl transferase name is also correct so now the acyl coenzyme is inside and it will undergo the beta oxidation. Beta oxidation is a cyclical process. Every time we carry out one beta oxidation, the size of the carbon chain will decrease by 2 carbon. So if you start with carbon 16, it will become carbon 14, then 12, 10, 8, 6, 4, 2 like that. And every time we carry out one round of beta oxidation, the products that we get are 1 NADH, 1 FADH2 and 1 acetyl coenzyme these are the products that we get every time we carry out the beta oxidation so the primary question in beta oxidation is how many rounds of beta oxidation are required to break down a saturated fatty acid having n number of carbon the answer to that question is n by 2 minus 1 all right with this answer in mind we get 7 nadh from the carbon 16 saturated fatty acid 7 fadh2 and 8 acetyl coenzyme A. Overall, 108 ATP are produced, but we said that 2 ATP are required for activation. So, the net gain on complete oxidation of the palmitic acid will be 106 ATP. You calculated the energetics for the stearic acid and you gave the answer of 120 ATP. Alright, remember these two values. Okay, the reactions which are occurring in the beta oxidation per se, first a dehydrogenation which generates FADH2, then hydrate, hydratase, second dehydrogenation which generates the NADH and last thiolase which generates the acetyl coenzyme A and decreases the size of the fatty acid by 2 carbon. The 2 carbon are released in the form of acetyl coenzyme A. If you don't remember the intermediates, if you don't remember the products, but just remember the enzymes that is more than enough. Alright, you don't need to remember the exact reactions per se. For unsaturated fatty acid, see, and this is the condition where we have the unsaturated fatty acid. So, unsaturated fatty acid uh, carries out an intermediate step whereby it is first converted to the saturated fatty acid. Alright, in that case, you can see one FADH2 generated will be less. And once it becomes a saturated fatty acid, then it undergoes the routine beta oxidation then it undergoes the routine beta oxidation for odd chain fatty acid we said the last product that we get is the propanyl coenzyme a. we saw how the propanyl coenzyme a is converted into the succinyl coenzyme a. for this purpose it requires two very important vitamins b7 and b12 b7 and b12 are required whereby the propanyl coenzyme a is converted into the succinyl coenzyme a. i told you if b12 is deficient then we get the condition methyl malonic aciduria the concentration of methyl malonyl uh, methyl malonate in the urine is used to uh, identify the deficiency of b12 this external coenzyme will go to tca cycle it can also participate in the gluconeogenesis then we talked about the uh, alpha oxidation and the omega oxidation so this is about the oxidation of the fatty acids
very commonly the oxidation of fatty acid can come as a long question or a part of the long question on the fatty acid so you should know what to write when we get the beta oxidation or simply the oxidation of fatty acid so depending on the question if it says oxidation of fatty acid you must mention that three oxidation alpha beta omega in addition the very long chain fatty acid are metabolized by the peroxisome so this is the introduction that you will give if it mentions fatty acid oxidation if it specifies the beta oxidation then you directly go to the beta oxidation you say that the beta oxidation is a cyclical process it is a cyclical process whereby after every cycle the size of the beta chain is reduced by two carbon in each round of beta oxidation a set of reactions are catalyzed by uh, two dehydrogenases the hydratase and thiolase resulting in the formation of the NADH FADH2 and acetyl coenzyme to break down a fatty acid having n number of carbon total round of beta oxidation is required n by 2 minus 1 energetics is calculated correspondingly if each NADH giving us the uh, 2.5 ATP FADH2 giving us 1.5 ATP and acetyl coenzyme giving us 10 ATP you can take the example of either carbon 16 or carbon 18 and do the calculations at the same time depending on marks you can also give the example if it is the odd chain fatty acid what happens to the propionyl coenzyme A yes i'll repeat the small chain and the medium chain fatty acid can enter the matrix without the need for carnitine it is only the long chain fatty acid which must follow the pathway the small and medium chain can follow the pathway or they can enter on their own all right so this is all for today and uh, tomorrow we will be talking about the various uh, biosynthetic activities uh, uh, one of your friends has asked how these reactions occur inside the living body then how these are studies sir so see uh, to study the reaction what we do when we use uh, tagged molecules in the past uh, when the effect of radioactivity was not well known so we used to uh, make use of uh, radioactive labeled uh, the molecules but now we make use of carbon 14 all right it is very easy to distinguish uh, carbon 12 from carbon 14 by measuring uh, the radiation and carbon 14 labeled molecules are used and we continuously keep freezing the process of metabolism and we find the intermediates so with the help of uh, puzzle as you solve the puzzle you get one piece you arrange it then you get another piece you arrange it so what we do we give the intermediates and then uh, we take out the end product we allow the process to carry on and we take out the end product obviously the molecules will be in different stages of metabolism so uh, we expect that we get all the different intermediates which are involved in the pathway this will help us to trace how the carbon 14 is uh, traveling and by tracking the various molecules in which the carbon 14 is entering we are able to determine the route taken by carbon 14 and we are able to decipher how the pathway is working so uh, it is a very uh, detective sort of work we have to be very careful we are not missing we are not confusing uh, the uh, molecules that we are getting we should not uh, 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 you can you say uh, uh, garble up the interpretation of the metabolites that we are getting it is a very uh, tedious careful and cumbersome process whereby we feed the intermediates gradually and gradually having the carbon 14 content and as we keep getting the metabolites the pathway becomes clearer and clearer it doesn't become clear in one shot we get a small part of the pathway then from there we make more intermediates having those uh, uh, molecules and label them with carbon 14 then gradually more and more of the pathway becomes clearer and this is how the whole pathway is elaborated it is not a very simple process it takes time a lot of trial and error is required 
and it requires a lot of patience to completely elucidate the pathways what we are studying just now is the result of hard work of uh, thousands of scientists spread over uh, uh, i will easily say almost uh, two centuries of work is involved in understanding and these pathways all right so uh, like we say every generation stands on the shoulders of giants of previous generation whatever work has been done by previous generation we use that and we build upon that work this is true for the metabolic pathways also so for today i would say the class is over please be here at sharp 8 o'clock tomorrow and tomorrow we'll be talking about the biosynthetic pathways in the meantime please take care and stay safe don't uh, take chance in uh, this covid crisis if you're going out you must take all the precautions use the mask hand washing social distancing and uh, take care of your family members also stay safe and be here sharp at 8 o'clock tomorrow take care bye bye and good night